Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations, the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The clerk. Government business, notice number one, motion offering an apology to Australia's indigenous peoples. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I move that today we honour the Indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations, this blemished chapter in our national history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page. A new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. We, the Parliament of Australia, respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered, as part of the healing of the nation. For the future, we take heart, resolving that this new page in the history of our great continent can now be written. We today take this first step 
by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians. A future where this parliament resolves that the injustices of the past must never, never happen again. A future where we harness the determination of all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us and life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity. A future where we embrace the possibility of new solutions to enduring problems where old approaches have failed. A future based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. A future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country, Australia. Mr Speaker, there comes a time in the history of nations when their peoples must become fully reconciled to their past if they are to go forward with confidence to embrace their future. Our nation, Australia, has reached such a time, and that is why the parliament is today here assembled, to deal with this unfinished business of the nation, to remove a great stain from the nation's soul, and in a true spirit of reconciliation, to open a new chapter in the history of this great land, Australia. Mr Speaker, last year I made a commitment to the Australian people that if we form the next government of the Commonwealth, we would in Parliament say sorry to the stolen generations. Mr Speaker, today I honour that commitment. I said we would do so early in the life of the new Parliament. Mr Speaker, again today I honour that commitment by doing so at the commencement of this, the 42nd Parliament, of the Commonwealth. Because the time has come, well and truly come, for all peoples of our great country, for all citizens of our great Commonwealth, for all Australians, those who are Indigenous and those who are not, to come together to reconcile and together build a new future for our nation. Some have asked why I apologise. Let me begin to answer by telling the parliament just a little of one person's story. An elegant, eloquent and wonderful woman in her 80s, full of life, full of funny stories, despite what has happened in her life's journey. A woman who has travelled a long way to be with us today. A member of the Stolen Generation who shared some of her story with me when I called round to see her just a few days ago. Nana Nungalau Fijo, as she prefers to be called, was born in the late 1920s. She remembers her earliest childhood days, living with her family and her community in a bush camp just outside Tennant Creek. She remembers the love and the warmth and the kinship of those days long ago, including traditional dancing around the campfire at night. She loved the dancing. She remembers once getting into strife when, as a four-year-old girl, she insisted on dancing with the male tribal elders, rather than just sitting and watching the men, as the girls were supposed to do. But then, sometime around 1932, when she was about four, she remembers the coming of the welfare men. Her family had feared that day and had dug holes in the creek bank where the children could run and hide. What they hadn't expected was that the white welfare men didn't come alone. They brought a truck, they brought two white men and an Aboriginal stockman on horseback, cracking his stock whip. The kids were found, they ran for their mothers, screaming, but they couldn't get away. They were herded and piled onto the back of the truck. Tears flowing, her mum tried clinging to the sides of the truck as her children were taken away to the bungalow in Alice, all in the name of protection. A few years later, government policy changed. Now the children would be handed over to the missions to be cared for by the churches. But which church would care for them? The kids were simply told to line up in three lines. Nana Fijo and her sisters stood in the middle line, 
her older brother and cousin on her left. Those on the left were told that they had become Catholics, those in the middle, Methodists, and those on the right, Church of England. That's how the complex questions of post-Reformation theology were resolved in the Australian outback in the 1930s. It was as crude as that. She and her sister were sent to a Methodist mission on Goulburn Island and then Croker Island. Her Catholic brother was sent to work at a cattle station and her cousin to a Catholic mission. Nana Fijo's family had been broken up for a second time. She stayed at the mission until after the war when she was allowed to leave for a pre-arranged job as a domestic in Darwin. She was 16. Nana Fijo never saw her mum again. After she left the mission, her brother let her know that her mum had died years before, a broken woman fretting for the children that had literally been ripped away from her. I asked Nana Fijo what she would have me say today about her story. She thought for a few moments, then said that what I should say today was that all mothers are important. And she added, families, keeping them together is very important. It's a good thing that you are surrounded by love and that love is passed down the generations. That's what gives you happiness. As I left later on, Nana Fijo took one of my staff aside, wanting to make sure that I wasn't too hard on the Aboriginal stockman who'd hunted those kids down all those years ago. The stockman had found her again decades later, this time himself to say, sorry. And remarkably, extraordinarily, she had forgiven him. Nana Fijo's is just one story. There are thousands, tens of thousands of them. Stories of forced separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their mums and dads over the better part of a century. Some of these stories are graphically told in Bringing Them Home, the report commissioned in 1995 by Prime Minister Keating and received in 1997 by Prime Minister Howard. There is something terribly primal about these first-hand accounts. The pain is searing. It screams from the pages. The hurt, the humiliation, the degradation, and the sheer brutality of the act of physically separating a mother from her children is a deep assault on our senses and on our most elemental humanity. These stories cry out to be heard. They cry out for an apology. Instead, from the nation's parliament, there has been a stony and stubborn and deafening silence for more than a decade. A view that somehow we, the parliament, should suspend our most basic instincts of what is right and what is wrong. A view that instead we should look for any pretext to push this great wrong to one side, to leave it languishing with the historians, the academics, and the cultural warriors, as if the stolen generations are little more than an interesting sociological phenomenon. But the stolen generations are not intellectual curiosities. They are human beings, human beings who have been damaged deeply by the decisions of parliaments and governments. But as of today, the time for denial, the time for delay, has at last come to an end. Mr Speaker, the nation is demanding of its political leadership to take us forward. Mr Speaker, decency, human decency, universal human decency demands that the nation now steps forward to right an historical wrong. And that is what we are doing in this place today. But should there still be doubts as to why we must now act, let the parliament reflect for a moment on the following facts. That between 1910 and 1970, between 10 and 30 per cent of Indigenous children were forcibly taken from their mothers and fathers. That as a result, up to 50,000 children were forcibly taken from their families. That this was the product of the deliberate, calculated policies of the state as reflected in the explicit powers given to them under statute. That this policy was taken to such extremes by some administrative authority that the forced extractions of children of so-called mixed lineage was seen as part of a broader policy of dealing with, quote, the problem of the Aboriginal population, unquote. 
One of the most notorious examples of this approach was from the Northern Territory Protector of Natives, who stated, and I quote, generally by the fifth and invariably by the sixth generation, all native characteristics of the Australian Aborigine are eradicated. The problem of our half-castes, to quote the protector, will quickly be eliminated by the complete disappearance of the black race and the swift submergence of their progeny in the white." Unquote. The West Australian Protector of Natives expressed not dissimilar views, expounding them at length in Canberra in 1937 at the first national conference on Indigenous affairs that brought together the Commonwealth and state protectors of natives. These are uncomfortable things to be brought out into the light. They are not pleasant. They are profoundly disturbing. But we must acknowledge these facts if we are to deal once and for all with the argument that the policy of generic forced separation was somehow well motivated, justified by its historical context, and as a result, unworthy of any apology today. Then we come to the argument of intergenerational responsibility, also used by some to argue against giving an apology today. But let us remember the fact that the forced removal of Aboriginal children was happening as late as the early 1970s. The 1970s is not exactly a point in remote antiquity. There are still serving members of this parliament who were first elected to this place in the early 1970s. It is well within the adult memory span of many of us. The uncomfortable truth for us all is that the parliaments of the nation, individually and collectively, enacted statutes and delegated authority under those statutes that made the forced removal of children on racial grounds fully lawful. There is a further reason for an apology as well. It is that reconciliation is in fact an expression of a core value of our nation. And that value is a fair go for all. There is a deep and abiding belief in the Australian community that for the stolen generations, there was no fair go at all. And there is a pretty basic Aussie belief that says it's time to put right this most outrageous of wrongs. It is for these reasons, Mr Speaker, quite apart from concerns of fundamental human decency, that the governments and parliaments of this nation must make this apology. Because, put simply, the laws that our parliaments enacted made the stolen generations possible. We, the parliaments of the nation, are ultimately responsible. Not those who gave effect to our laws. The problem lay with the laws themselves. As has been said of settler societies elsewhere, we are the bearers of many blessings from our ancestors, and therefore we must also be the bearer of their burdens as well. Therefore, for our nation, the course of action is clear. Therefore, for our people, the course of action is clear. And that is to deal now with what has become one of the darkest chapters in Australia's history. In doing so, we are doing more than contending with the facts, the evidence and the often rancorous public debate. In doing so, we are also wrestling with our own soul. This is not, as some would argue, a black armband view of history. It's just the truth, the cold, confronting, uncomfortable truth. Facing with it, dealing with it, moving on from it. And until we fully confront that truth, there will always be a shadow hanging over us and our future as a fully united and fully reconciled people. It's time to reconcile. It's time to recognise the injustices of the past. It's time to say sorry. It's time to move forward together. To the stolen generations, I say the following. As Prime Minister of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Government of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Parliament of Australia, I am sorry. And I offer you this apology without qualification. We apologise for the hurt, the pain and suffering we, the Parliament, have caused you by the laws that previous Parliaments have enacted. We apologise for the indignity, the degradation and the humiliation these laws embodied. We offer this apology to the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the families and the communities whose lives were ripped apart by the actions of successive governments under successive parliaments. 
In making this apology, I would also like to speak personally to the members of the Stolen Generation and their families. Those here today, so many of you. To those listening across the nation, from Yundamu in the central west of the Northern Territory to Yabara in North Queensland and to Pichinjanjara in South Australia. I know that in offering this apology on behalf of the government and the parliament, there is nothing I can say today that can take away the pain you have suffered personally. Whatever words I speak today, I cannot undo that. Words alone are not that powerful. Grief is a very personal thing. I say to non-Indigenous Australians listening today, those who may not fully understand why we are doing what we are doing is so important. I ask those non-Indigenous Australians to imagine for a moment if this had happened to you. I say to honourable members here present, imagine if this had happened to us. Imagine the crippling effect. Imagine how hard it would be to forgive. But my proposal is this. If the apology we extend today is accepted in the spirit of reconciliation in which it is offered, we can today resolve together that there be a new beginning for Australia. And it is to such a new beginning that I believe the nation is now calling us. Australians are a passionate lot. We're also a very practical lot. For us, symbolism is important. But unless the great symbolism of reconciliation is accompanied by an even greater substance, it is little more than a clanging gong. It's not sentiment that makes history. It's our actions that make history. Today's apology, however inadequate, is aimed at righting past wrongs. It is also aimed at building a bridge between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, a bridge based on a real respect rather than a thinly veiled contempt. Our challenge for the future is now to cross that bridge and in so doing embrace a new partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Embracing as part of that partnership expanded link-up and other critical services to help the stolen generations to trace their families, if at all possible, and to provide dignity to their lives. But the core of this partnership for the future is closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians on life expectancy, educational achievement and employment opportunities. This new partnership on closing the gap will set concrete targets for the future within a decade to halve the widening gap in literacy, numeracy and employment outcomes and opportunities for Indigenous children, within a decade to halve the appalling gap in infant mortality rates between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children, and within a generation to close the equally appalling 17-year life gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous when it comes to overall life expectancy. The truth is, a business-as-usual approach towards Indigenous Australians is not working. Most old approaches are not working. We need a new beginning. A new beginning which contains real measures of policy success or policy failure. A new beginning, a new partnership on closing the gap with sufficient flexibility not to insist on a one-size-fits-all approach for each of the hundreds of remote and regional Indigenous communities across the country, but instead allows flexible, tailored, local approaches to achieve commonly agreed national objectives that lie at the core of our proposed new partnership. And a new beginning that draws intelligently on the experiences of new policy settings across the nation. However, unless we as a parliament set a destination for the nation. We have no clear point to guide our policy, our programs or our purpose, no central organising principle. So let us resolve today to begin with the little children, a fitting place to start on this day of apology for the stolen generations. Let us resolve over the next five years to have every Indigenous four-year-old in a remote Aboriginal community enrolled and attending a proper early childhood education centre or opportunity and engaged in proper pre-literacy and pre-numeracy programs. 
Let us resolve to build new educational opportunities for these little ones year by year, step by step, following the completion of their crucial preschool year. Let us resolve to use this systematic approach to building future educational opportunities for Indigenous children, to provide proper primary and preventative health care for the same children, to begin the task of rolling back the obscenity that we find today in infant mortality rates in remote Indigenous communities, up to four times higher than in other communities. None of this will be easy. Most of it will be hard, very hard. But none of it, none of it, is impossible. And all of it is achievable with clear goals, clear thinking, and by placing an absolute premium on respect, cooperation and mutual responsibility as the guiding principles of this new partnership on closing the gap. The mood of the nation is for reconciliation now between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The mood of the nation on Indigenous policy and politics is now very simple. The nation is calling on us, the politicians, to move beyond our infantile bickering, our point scoring and our mindlessly partisan politics and elevate this one, at least this one core area of national responsibility to a rare position beyond the partisan divide. Surely this is the spirit, the unfulfilled spirit, of the 1967 referendum. Surely, at least from this day forward, we should give it a go. So let me take this one step further, to take what some may see as a piece of political posturing and make a practical proposal to the opposition on this, on this day, the first full sitting day of the new parliament. I said before the election the nation needed a kind of war cabinet on parts of Indigenous policy because the challenges are too great and the consequences too great to just allow it all to become a political football as it's been so often in the past. I therefore propose a joint policy commission to be led by the Leader of the Opposition and myself, and with a mandate to develop and implement, to begin with, an effective housing strategy for remote communities over the next five years. It will be consistent with the government's policy framework, a new partnership for closing the gap. If this commission operates well, I then propose that it work on the further task of constitutional recognition of the First Australians, consistent with the long-standing platform commitments of my party and the pre-election position of the opposition. This would probably be desirable in any event because unless such a proposition was absolutely bipartisan, it would fail at a referendum. As I said before, the time has come for new approaches to enduring problems, and working constructively together on such defined projects, I believe, would meet with the support of the nation. It's time for fresh ideas to fashion the nation's future. Mr Speaker, today the parliament has come together to right a great wrong. We have come together to deal with the past so that we might fully embrace the future. And we have had sufficient audacity of faith to advance a pathway to that future with arms extended rather than with fists still clenched. So let us seize the day. Let it not become a moment of mere sentimental reflection. Let us take it with both hands and allow this day, this day of national reconciliation, to become one of those rare moments in which we might just be able to transform the way in which the nation thinks about itself, whereby the injustice administered to these stolen generations, in the name of these our parliaments, causes all of us to reappraise at the deepest level of our beliefs the real possibility of reconciliation writ large, reconciliation across all Indigenous Australia, reconciliation across the entire history of the often bloody encounter between those who emerged from the dream time a thousand generations ago and those who, like me, came across the seas only yesterday. Reconciliation which opens up whole new possibilities for the future. For the nation to bring the first two centuries of our settled history to a close as we begin a new chapter in which we embrace with pride, admiration and awe these great and ancient cultures we are blessed, truly blessed, to have among us. 
cultures that provide a unique, uninterrupted human thread linking our Australian continent to the most ancient prehistory of our planet, and growing from this new respect to see our indigenous brothers and sisters with fresh eyes, with new eyes, and with our minds wide open as to how we might tackle together the great practical challenges that Indigenous Australia faces in the future. So let us turn this page together, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, government and opposition, Commonwealth and state, and write this new chapter in our nation's story together. First Australians, first fleeters, and those who first took the oath of allegiance just a few weeks ago, let's grasp this opportunity to craft a new future for this great land, Australia. Mr Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, members of this, the 42nd Parliament of Australia, visitors and all Australians, in rising to speak strongly in support of this motion, I recognise the Ngunnawal, First Peoples of this Canberra land. Today our nation crosses a threshold. We formally offer an apology. We say sorry to those Aboriginal people forcibly removed from their families through the first seven decades of the 20th century. In doing so, we reach from within ourselves to our past, those whose lives connect us to it and in deep understanding of its importance to our future. We will be at our best today and every day if we pause to place ourselves in the shoes of others, imbued with the imaginative capacity to see this issue through their eyes with decency and respect. This chapter in our nation's history is emblematic of much of the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians from the arrival of the First Fleet in 1788. It is one of two cultures, one ancient, proud and celebrating its deep bond with this land for some 60,000 years. The other, no less proud, arrived here with little more than visionary hope, deeply rooted in gritty determination to build an Australian nation not only for its early settlers and indigenous peoples, but those who would increasingly come from all parts of the world. Whether Australian by birth or immigration, each one of us, each one of us as Australians, has a duty to understand and respect what has been done in our name. In most cases, we do with great pride, but in others, it is with shame. In brutally harsh conditions, from the small number of early British settlers, our non-Indigenous ancestors have given us a nation the envy of any in the world. But Aboriginal Australians made involuntary sacrifices, different but no less important 
to make Australia the economic and social development that we see of our country today. None of this was easy. We cannot, from the comfort of the 21st century, begin to imagine what they overcame, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to give us what we have and make us who we are. We do know, though, that language, disease, ignorance, good intentions, basic human prejudices and a cultural and technological chasm combined to deliver a harshness exceeded only by the land over which each sought to prevail. And as our young nation celebrated its federation, formal formality emerged in arrangements and laws that would govern the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The new nation's constitution, though, would not allow for the counting of natives or for the Commonwealth to pass laws in relation to Aborigines. Protection boards and reserves were established. Aborigines in some jurisdictions were excluded from public schools. Episodic violence in race relations continued. Assimilation underwrote emerging policies. And churches heeded their Christian doctrine to reach out to people whom they saw as being in desperate need. Though disputed in motive and detail, and with varying recollections of events by others, the removal of Aboriginal children began. In some cases, government policies evolved from the belief that the Aboriginal race would not survive and should be assimilated. In others, the conviction was that half-caste children, in particular, should, for their own protection, be removed to government and church-run institutions where conditions reflected the standards of the day. Others were placed with white families whose kindness motivated them to the belief that rescued children deserved a better life. Our responsibility, every one of us, is to understand what happened here, why it happened, the impact that it had not only on those who were removed, but also those who did the removing and those who supported it. Our generation does not own these actions, nor should it feel guilt for what was done in many, but certainly not all cases, with the best of intentions. But in saying we are sorry, and deeply so, we remind ourselves that each generation lives in ignorance of the long-term consequences of its decisions and its actions. Even when motivated by inherent humanity and decency to reach out to the dispossessed in extreme adversity, our actions can have unintended consequences. As such, many decent Australians are hurt by accusations of theft in relation to their good intentions. The stories are well documented. And I thank the Prime Minister for reminding us of Lorna Fijo's experience. I will repeat two. The first was a submission given to the Human Rights Inquiry into this. And I quote, I was at the post office with my mum and auntie and cousin. They put us in the police ute and said they were taking us to Broome. They put the mums in there as well. But when we'd been gone about 10 miles, they stopped and threw the mothers out of the car. We jumped on our mothers' backs, crying, trying not to be left behind, but the policeman pulled us off and threw us back in the car. They pushed the mothers away and drove off, while our mothers were chasing the car, running and crying after us. We were screaming in the back of that car. When we got to Broome, they put me and my cousin in the Broome lockup. We were only 10 years old. We were in the lockup for two days waiting for the boat to Perth. In his black oral history, which I commend to every Australian, The Wailing, Stuart Rintoll records the pain, the thin pain, of an Aboriginal woman from Walgett. And I quote, something else that never left my mind, my memory, was of a family of children being taken away. And this little girl, she must have been about the same age as myself, 
I suppose she might have been about six. But I can still see that little person on the back of the mission truck with a little rag hat on, and she went away, and we never seen her anymore. She was crying. Everyone was crying. Things like that never leave your memory. It's reasonably argued that removal from squalor led to better lives. Children fed, housed and educated for an adult world of which they could not have imagined. However, from my life as a family doctor and knowing the impact of my own father's removal from his unmarried teenage mother, not knowing who you are is the source of deep, scarring sorrows, the real meaning of which can be known only to those who have endured it. No one should bring a sense of moral superiority to this debate in seeking to diminish the view that good in many cases was sought to be done. This is a complex issue. Faye Lyman's life is one of the many voices, oral history, at the, Australian, at the National Library of Australia. Faye left her father when she was eight. She said this. Personally, I don't want people to say, I'm sorry, Faye. I just want them to understand. It was very hurtful to leave Dad. Oh, it broke my heart. Dad said to me, it's hard for Daddy and the authorities won't let you stay with me in a tent on the riverbank. You're a little girl and you need someone to look after you. I remember him telling us that and I cried and I said, no, but Dad, you look after us. But they kept telling us it wasn't the right thing. She went on, I don't want people to say sorry. I just want them to understand the hurt, what happened when we were initially separated, and just understand the society, that what they have done, you don't belong in either world. I can't explain it. It hurts so much. There is no compensation fund for this, nor should there be. How can any sum of money replace a life deprived of knowing your family? Separation was then and remains today a painful but necessary part of public policy in the protection of children. Our restitution for this lies in our determination to address today's injustices, learning from what was done and doing everything we can to heal those who suffered. The period within which these events occurred was one that defined and shaped Australia. The governments that oversaw this and those who elected them emerged from federating the nation to a century characterised for Australia as triumph in the face of extraordinary adversities unknown to our generation. In offering this apology, let us not, in our language and our actions, create one injustice in our attempt to address another. Let no one forget that they sent their sons to war, shaping our identity and place in the world. 100,000 in two wars alone gave their lives in our name and our uniform, lying forever in distant lands, silent witnesses to the future that they have given us. Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians lie alongside one another. These generations considered their responsibilities to their country and one another more important than their rights. They didn't buy something till they'd saved up for it, and values were far more important than value. Living in considerably more difficult times, they had dreams for our nation, but little money. Theirs was a mesh of values enshrined in God, King and country, and the belief in something greater than yourself. Neglectful indifference to all that they have achieved, while seeing their actions in the separations only, through the values of our comfortable, modern Australia, will be to diminish ourselves. Today our nation pauses to reflect on this chapter of relations between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australia. In doing so, however, given that there are so many Australians who perhaps unusually today are focused on Aboriginal issues, 
spare a thought for the real, immediate, seemingly intractable and disgraceful circumstances in which many Indigenous Australians find themselves today. As we meet and speak in this parliament, Aboriginal Australians continue to die long before the rest of us. Alcohol, welfare without responsibilities, isolation from the economic mainstream, corrupt management of resources, nepotism, political buck passing between governments with divided responsibilities, lack of home ownership, under policing, and tolerance by authorities of neglect and abuse of children that violates all for which we stand all combined to see too many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living lives of existential aimlessness. Indigenous life expectancy is still stubbornly 17 years less than for non-Indigenous Australians. A baby born while we speak, an Aboriginal baby, still has only a one in three chance of seeing the age of 65. Diabetes, kidney disease, hospitalisation of women from assault, imprisonment, overcrowding in housing, educational underperformance and unemployment remain appallingly high, despite gains in some areas over the past decade. Annual Indigenous-specific spending by the Commonwealth has reached $3.5 billion a year, plus half a billion dollars this year on the Northern Territory intervention. The sexual abuse of Aboriginal children was found in every one of the 45 Northern Territory communities surveyed for the Little Children Are Sacred report. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, driving the Howard government's decision to intervene with a suite of dramatically radical welfare, health and policing initiatives. I can't imagine the strength upon which she drew, but the Alice Springs Crown prosecutor Nanette Rogers, with great courage, revealed to the nation in 2006 the case of a four-year-old girl drowned while being raped by a teenager who had been sniffing petrol. She told us of the two children, one a baby, sexually assaulted by two men while their mothers were drinking alcohol. Another baby was stabbed by a man trying to kill her mother. So too a ten-year-old girl was gang raped in Aracoon, the offenders going free, barely punished. A boy was raped in another community by other children. Is this not an emergency? The most disturbing part of it being its endemic nature and Australia's apparent desensitisation to it. Yet governments responsible for delivering services and security have resisted elements of the Northern Territory style intervention. I ask the Prime Minister to report to this parliament regularly on what his government is doing to save this generation of Aboriginal Australians from these appalling conditions. I also offer on behalf of the opposition my unconditional support to participate in the commission for policy which he proposes. This is far, far more important than any of the things that would normally divide us as a nation in philosophy and politics. Our generation has, over 35 years, overseen a system of welfare, alcohol delivery, administration of programs, episodic preoccupation with symbolism, and at times even excusing the inexcusable in the name of cultural sensitivity to create what we now see in remote Aboriginal Australia. With good intentions, perhaps like earlier generations, we have, under successive governments, created lives in many cases of misery for which we might apologise. I certainly do. The best way we can show it is to act and to act now. I challenge anyone who thinks Aboriginal people get a good deal to come to any of these communities and tell me you wish you had been born there. The first Aboriginal Australian who came to this parliament was Neville Bonner, a younger man abandoned by his non-Aboriginal father before his birth on Eucabar Island in the mouth of the Tweed River. Neville was born into a life of hardship known only to some who are here today as visitors. 
He grew up in a hollow that had been carved by his grandfather under lantana bushes. The year before his mother's death, when he was nine, she sent him to a school near Lismore. He lasted two days before the non-Aboriginal people forced his exclusion. It was to his grandmother Ida he attributed his final success. Arguing at 14 that the boy must go to school, she had said to him, Neville, if you learn to read and write, express yourself well, and treat people with decency and courtesy, it will take you a long way. And it did. Through a life as a scrub clearer, a ringer, a stockman, a bridge carpenter, and 11 years on Palm Island, it brought him to this parliament in 1971 as the events of this motion were nearing an end. He said in prophetic words to the Liberal Party members who selected him, in my experience of this world, two qualities are always in greater need, human understanding and compassion. When he was asked by Robin Hughes in 1992 to reflect on his life, Neville observed that the unjust hardships he had endured and I quote, can only be changed when people of non-Aboriginal extraction are prepared to listen, to hear what Aboriginal people are saying, and then work with us to achieve those ends. Asked to nominate his greatest achievement, he replied, it is that I was there. They no longer spoke of bungs or blacks. They spoke instead of Aboriginal people. Today is about being there as a nation and as individual Australians. It is about Neville Bonner's understanding of one another and the compassion that shaped his life in literally reaching out to those whom he considered had suffered more than him. We honour those in our past who have suffered, many of whom are, are here today and all who have made sacrifices for us by the way we live our lives and shape our nation. Today we recommit to do so as one people. We are sorry. Whilst it might seem redundant, I ask members to signify their support. I invite honourable members to rise in their places. I thank the House. Order, I understand it might uh, suit the convenience of the House if uh, we pause whilst the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition pay their respects to people in the Distinguished Visitors Gallery.
Ra rather than uniquely the <laughs> Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on indulgence. Well, I'm, I'm measuring up the chair. <laughs> Uh, Mr Speaker, the Stolen Generation representatives here today have asked me to make this presentation on their behalf to you as the Speaker of the Parliament, and together with the Leader of the Opposition, I'd like to make that presentation to you now. I gratefully receive this gift on behalf of the House. It will represent a very important point in the history of not only this chamber but our nation. The Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I ask leave of the House to refer the matter to the main committee for further debate. Is there any objection to leave being granted? Leave is granted. Leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I thank the opposition. I move that the resumption of debate on the Prime Minister's motion relating to offering an apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples be referred to the main committee. The question is that the resumption of the debate on the Prime Minister's motion relating to offering an apology to Australia's Indigenous peoples be referred to the main committee. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The chair will be resumed on the ringing of the bells, which I expect to be at approximately 11.30 a.m.
come up here to the lectern. Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention, please? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Could we encourage those people here who are still standing out on the representative side to move into the, uh, the, the members hall, please? Good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Could I initially introduce to you Helen Moran, the Indigenous Chair of the National Sorry Day Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Before I commence, I'd like to say that there may be images of deceased people presented here in this next moment. If that is a problem for you, please take whatever measures you need um, to, um, to turn away or whatever you need to do to protect yourself. Thank you. Okay, children, bring them up. I'm going to start walking up on the stage with the auntie. I'm just taking over the uh, protocol task here and asking you, mob, to be quiet so we can start. Is that what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> Thank you, friend. I'll just say it again. Just, just briefly look at I, what? Just quickly, briefly look at what the children are. Oh, okay. Thank you. Our children are our future. They help carry the ancestors forward for all, our culture, our knowledge, and the essence of our people. With the photos they hold, they bring their ancestors' spirit to us all today. The stolen generations who walked with them bring the gift of the Prime Minister's apology and the strength of their endurance, courage to be stolen children and to have survived. Together, these stolen generations that stand before you stand with those of the past that are depicted in the photos and those of the future who hold them. And with all of us here together now, we stand in the present. Thank you. Would you all like to? Ladies and gentlemen, could I now introduce Mr. Tom Kelmer, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, nominated by the Stolen Generations Alliance and the National Sorry Day Committee to provide an Indigenous response to the apology. Mr. Kelmer. Prime Minister, the Honourable Kevin Rudd. Opposition Leader Brendan Nelson, Minister for Indigenous Affairs the Honourable Jenny Macklin, former Prime Ministers Professor Bruce Wilson representing the, the late Sir Ronald Wilson, Stolen Generations patrons Lois O'Donoghue and Bobby Randall, Chair of the National Sorry Day Committee Helen Moran and Chair of the Stolen Generations Alliance Christine F uh, King. Ministers. Members of the Stolen Generations and, and your families, my Indigenous brothers and sisters and distinguished guests from around Australia and overseas. 
May I begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal peoples, the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, and pay my respects to you and your elders. I've been asked by the National Sorry Day Committee and the Stolen Generation Alliance, the two national bodies who represent the stolen generations and their families, to respond to the parliamentary apology and to briefly talk about the importance of today's event. I'm deeply honoured to be entrusted with this responsibility and to participate in today's proceedings. I'm particularly honoured to do so in my capacity as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner at the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. The inaugural Social Justice Commissioner, Professor Mick Dodson, was the co-commissioner of the National Inquiry, along with the late Sir Ronald Wilson, who was president at the time, and that culminated in the Bringing Them Home report. The next Social Justice Commissioner, Dr Bill Jonas, contributed greatly to the understanding of the report and the importance of its meaning, and I'm the third Social Justice Commissioner. Today is, a, is an historic day. It's the day our leaders across the political spectrum have chosen dignity, hope and respect as the guiding principles for the relationship with our First Nations peoples. Through one direct act, the Parliament has acknowledged the existence and the impacts of past policies and practices of forcibly removing Indigenous children from their families and by so doing has paid respect to the stolen generations for their suffering and their loss and for their resilience and ultimately for their dignity. Let me tell you what the apology means to me. For many years my family has been searching in vain to find information about my great-grandmother on my father's side who was taken away at the turn of the 20th century. Recently, Linkup in Darwin located some information in the archives. In a document titled List of Half Castes in the Northern Territory, dated on 2 December 1899, a government official named George Thompson wrote the following about my great grandmother. Her name was May, and he wrote Half caste May is a well grown girl, is living with her mother in the blacks' camp at Woolwonga. Her mother will not part with her. She mixes up a great deal with the Chinaman. She only has a naga on. My great-grandmother's ideal was not uncommon, and nor was the chilling account, her mother will not part with her. This is not a black armband issue, and it's not an issue of guilt. It never was. It's about belonging. The introductory words of the 1997 Bringing Them Home report reminds us of this. It reads, the past is very much with us today in the continuing devastation of the lives of Indigenous Australians. That devastation cannot be addressed unless the whole community listens with an open heart and mind to the stories of what has happened in the past and, having listened and understood, commits itself to reconciliation. By acknowledging and paying respect, Parliament has now laid the foundations for healing to take place and for a reconciled Australia in which everybody belongs. For today is not just about the stolen generations, it's about all Australians. Today's actions enables every single one of us to move forward together with joint aspirations and a national story that contains a shared past and a future. It is a matter of great sadness that the experiences of the, of the stolen generations has been used as a source of division amongst the Australian community since the release of the Bringing Them Home report. There are many individuals out there who have made their names as stolen generations deniers and rebuffers. This vitriol has re-traumatised many of the stolen generations. It has cast doubts on the integrity of many individuals and ultimately has denied in Indigenous peoples basic human dignity and decency. These are not traits associated with the Australian way, and nor is it any way to respond to human tragedy. Let us feel proud that we are now facing the difficult and dark experiences from our past in order to move on. Let us also feel proud, as a nation, that we respect our fellow citizens. We care for their plight and we offer our hands in friendship so that we may all enjoy the bounty 
of this great nation. Prime Minister, can I thank you for your leadership on this issue and for the support and compassion of your minister, Jenny Macklin. It is far more difficult. Thank you. It is far more difficult to try and unite people than to divide them. Your efforts should be praised universally for attempting to create a bridge between the many diverse elements of our society. To the Leader of the Opposition, can I also acknowledge your leadership. It is of great significance that this motion was passed today with bipartisanship support. For too long, Indigenous peoples have been used as a political football. More often than not, this has promoted fear, misunderstanding, intolerance and inaction. And it's that inaction that we have to change. And to all parliamentarians, I say, let today begin a, be a new beginning, not an end point. Last month, I facilitated discussions between the government and stolen generations groups about the apology. The overwhelming message from these meetings was that this should be seen as the first step in a partnership. The stolen generations have needs that have yet to be met, mainly due to underfunding of link-ups and other support organisations. There remains a pressing need for specific assistance tailored to particular circumstances uh, of those forcibly removed from their families. And there are many recommendations of the Bringing the Home report that have not been implemented. In fact, there, have been, there has been little attempt to even consider many of these recommendations at the federal or state level in recent years, or for them to be implemented systemically across all jurisdictions. To the premiers and, sta and state and territory government representatives here today, I urge, I urge you to join in that partnership to address the unfinished business. Prime Minister, I mentioned earlier that it's harder to try and unite people than to divide them. And this is because people have hope, and people who do have hope also have expectations. The consultations between your government and the Stolen Generations groups identified a number of elements to build upon from today. And these include committing to a partnership with Stolen Generations groups, as well as link-ups and other service providers with ongoing consultation and participation committing to a comprehensive government response to the needs of the stolen generations, as identified in the Bringing Them Home report, and thirdly, adopting a whole of government approach across all departments and across all gov governments to achieve this. And I was very heartened to hear that there is bipartisan support for the commission that you're proposing. And there is hope that today's apology can, can create the impetus for a renewed partnership between the federal and state and territory governments to fully implement the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. It is timely that the federal government take the leadership role in developing a national process to make this happen. Finally, can I acknowledge the support of the many millions of non-Indigenous Australians who have walked with us on the path to reconciliation and justice? And can I pay tribute to the members of the Stolen Generations for your incredible resilience, stoicism and dignity in the face of untold suffering. Let your healing begin and let the healing of the nation begin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister. I begin by uh, honouring our traditional owners of this land and across all the lands of this great continent, Australia. What a great day for the nation. What a fantastic day for all Australians. One of the great things about this country of ours is that um, it takes us a, a little bit of time but when we spot something wrong, ultimately we get around to it. 
Can I begin by acknowledging uh, Commissioner Tom Kelman? I thank him for his remarks just now. Indigenous fellow Australians, particularly the representatives of the members of the Stolen Generation here with us, Stolen Generation patrons, Dr. Loitra O'Donoghue and Bobby Randall and Chairs Helen Moran and Christine King, the Premiers and Chief Ministers who have made time to be with us today, Premier Yenna, Yemma, Premier Lennon Premier, and Chief Minister Stanhope, former Prime Ministers Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, former Governor-General Sir William Dean, Professor Bruce Wilson representing the family of Sir Ronald Wilson. Today, I have a bit of shush over in the corner there, <laughs> can't even hear myself think. The, um, today is not about us, it's not about politicians, it's about you. It is about the indigenous peoples of this land. It's about the stolen generations of this land. And today you are here as our honoured guests. Welcome to our parliament. It was a truly moving experience this morning for uh, Therese, my wife, myself and Jenny, the minister, to stand at the official ceremonial entrance, um, the Prime Minister's um, uh, wing, to welcome so many of our representatives and to hear just a little bit of where you've come from and a little bit of your stories, travelling all the way from the Kimberleys, from Arnhem Land, from Albany, from the, uh, the Central Desert, from around Alice, from far north Queensland, from um, La Perouse. It's just up the road, actually. <laughs> Our local people here from Canberra and its environs, and Victoria and Tassie, and the Pitchett and Jarrah lands and other lands in South Australia. Can I just say, you do us a great honour by coming to be with us because were you not here with us today, this day would mean nothing. It means everything because you are here today with us to celebrate it. I would also thank those who have gone before us in the great struggle for this day, our Indigenous leaders, but also to honour those who have worked hard in the fields in the political processes of this country as well. And I would like in particular to honour our former Prime Ministers who are here with us today. Gough Whitlam. A great friend of Aboriginal people from the beginning. Malcolm Fraser, a great friend of Aboriginal people from the beginning. Bob Hawke, a great friend of Aboriginal people from the beginning. And Paul Keating, a great friend of Aboriginal people. The great thing about the fabric of our nation's story is it's written not just by one of us or a few of us, it's written by all of us. And those who have gone before us, I would pay honour and tribute to the contribution they have made both in office and since leaving office to make this day possible. I also want to make particular reference to the work of former Governor-General Sir William Dean. Where are you, Bill? You've disappeared somewhere. The slow ticking conscience within the ranks of the political and broader establishment of this country, always prodding gently and other times less so, <laughs> pushing, shoving, <laughs> causing us all never to forget to move on. Sir William, I thank you for the actions of quiet, persistent conscience which you have represented among us all. And Professor Bruce Wilson, who here represents his father, Sir Ronald Wilson. Uh, Sir Ronald did a good thing. Let us honour his memory in the work that he did. <laughs> and
And in terms of the ranks of uh, my own government, could I also pay particular thanks to Jenny Macklin. Yeah. You know, I've been around long enough to know that when it comes to this thing called consultation, consulting our Indigenous leaders, easier said than done. <laughs> and I think you all know what I mean. But I would just pay tribute to Jenny's enormous generosity of spirit, her warmth, her patience, her commitment and dedication to making sure that right across the fabric of our nation and its Indigenous leaders and communities that she was able to speak with your representatives and to make sure we got today as right as possible. Thank you, Jenny. And you know, that's about it from me. I'm here to thank those of you who... Yeah. I'm here today to thank those of you who have survived, those of you strong enough to be with us today on, the, on behalf of Indigenous Australia. I'm here to thank those from the rest of the Australian community who have laboured long and hard in the fields to make this possible. But I conclude with this one thought. Today, this day, this day of national reconciliation, we have said sorry to make right the wrongs of the past. And the purpose is to move forward to the future together. Let us resolve to make this day the day when we began a new chapter in the nation's story, written together by each and every one of us, Australians, one and all. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable Dr. Brendan Nelson, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, Prime Minister Rudd, Social Justice uh, Commissioner Tom Calmer, Minister Jenny Macklin, the former Prime Ministers that are here, all of you who are members of the Stolen Generation and the many visitors uh, here to the Federal Parliament. I recognise, of course, the Ngunnawal, traditional owners of the Canberra region. I think we've probably just about had enough talking today, even though we've been looking forward to it, but um, i just say two things. In 1995, I had the privilege of meeting the great Rose Collis, and she gave me a book entitled Reaching Back, about the Aboriginal people in the Yarraba region. And Rose, of course, as many of you know, has spent her life working with Aboriginal people, her people, who have been under enormous, enormous duress, and in particular ravaged by alcohol and homelessness. And I asked her, what does reconciliation mean? And she said, I have been trying to reconcile it all my life. Today is a significant event, but reconciliation is a process and a journey which will last all of our lives. Events like today remind us as a nation as to where, in our best selves, we know we need to go. As people who care for one another, who understand the world through the eyes of one another, and in particular, as we said in the House today, respect the difference, but indeed the importance, of our common cultures to not only our past, but more importantly, our future. I commend all of those who, over a long period of time, as the Prime Minister has said, have worked so hard for this day, and together all of us will make this a better nation, and we will not ever repeat some of the things for which we say sorry today. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes the formalities of this morning tea. Thank you.